In May of 2020, America was feeling intense stress everywhere. The entire world was stressed. It was the beginning of the third month of quarantine and lockdowns because of COVID. Businesses were suffering. Schools were in upheaval. Hospitals were filling with patients. Uncertainty and fear dominated the world scene. As tensions grew, America suffered a devastating blow on May 25th when George Floyd died in the custody of police in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Over the next 48 hours, it became evident the United States was entering a time of great change. Hands up, don't shoot! Hands up! All eyes were on Minneapolis. As the city raged with anger, one man looked for a way to calm the storm. His name, Dr. Charles Karuku. People came out of quarantine and they just began shouting, no justice, no peace, prosecute the police. And the momentum began building, anger began building. It broke out into violence, to looting, to burning of buildings. It was chaos everywhere. And that began spreading across America, to New York, to Los Angeles, to Washington, D.C. And the whole nation was experiencing this mayhem, and that's when we knew we have to do something. This is the place where America was wounded. And we believe as we start from Minneapolis, it's gonna spread across America. Do you believe it? Hello there people, Dr. Charles Karuku here, and I am in Minneapolis, right in the middle of a pile of rumble. This has been one of the most devastating destruction that has ever happened in the city of Minneapolis. It's still raw, and you can see around me all the ruins and all the rumble, but I feel in my heart hope arising. Charles was born in Kenya, Africa, at the age of 19, he made a decision to give his life to Jesus Christ, and he hasn't looked back. He made a covenant with God to walk with him the rest of his life. In 1997, he came to America to attend Free Independent Bible Institute. Four years later, he married Lindsay, an American. Together, they continued to serve the church and citizens of Minneapolis. The church was in quarantine, but there was a few brave Christians who came out and they began to pray. They began to gather into the basements, into the uh, corner of that year in Chicago, praying, fasting, but we were not united. We were all in different little groups spread across the city. Charles and his wife planned a worship and prayer rally on June 7th, 2020 at the place where Mr. Floyd died. They had no idea how many would come, if anyone. Their hope was to bring unity in a city divided. We had hundreds of people, probably over a thousand maybe, who gathered and most of them were with us in prayer, lifting up their hands and crying out to God for revival. All colors, black, white, brown. They were hugging and crying on shoulders of each other praying for unity and healing and racial reconciliation in our land. We ask you to cleanse this place. Cleanse it with the blood of Jesus. Turn this place into a place of healing. Let the healing begin. Let the healing begin. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, shout to Jesus. We were walking through 2 Chronicles 7, 14, and we wanted to see God bring us together. So we humble ourselves, we pray, seek his face, and we believe he'll heal our land. One week later, on June 14th, Sean Foyt, a worship leader from California, wanted to bring a worship event to Minneapolis 
right in the midst of the memorial that had been created by citizens. I got a message from one friend of mine that hey, Sean is wanting to come and worship on the corner of that year in Chicago, race a sound of worship. Uh, we said, you know what, Sean, it's not possible. White people are not coming here. There was a clear message being sent from day one. This is a black issue. This is our space. This is our time to mourn. White brothers and sisters get on the periphery. But to grab a mic, to be on stage and to speak, the white people are not allowed to do that. Sean was not allowed to speak. A lot of people were saying, don't come. How dare you? You are a white man trying to take advantage of a black tragedy. I felt like that was a very divisive message. You know what we told him? Just come. Don't tell anybody you are coming. Come under the radar. We'll have you. And guess what? We had church. We had a powerful time on that corner. Hey everybody, I am here on 38th in Chicago with my brother. We just had one of the most powerful times of worship and ministry and revival I've ever had in America. You see, the streets of 38th and Chicago is where the riot started and the Lord is turning this riot into a revival right before our eyes. This is what God has been speaking, that I want to visit the streets of America and I'm going to bring my joy. We have to let it go out Come into on. the streets and sweep these streets, sweep out the injustices and cleanse every demonic stronghold. A month later, Sean Foyt began a worship tour to cities across America. He called these gatherings, Let Us Worship. California banned singing and chanting in churches because of a surge in coronavirus cases. But one local pastor is taking action. Millennial Sean Foyt is bringing his worship services outside. I think people are really hungry to get together. You know, the church has been quarantined for, you know, many months now. And as we're seeing across America, People need the spiritual life that the church brings. They need this togetherness, this sense of connection through worship and singing. And so our heart is to come and meet that spiritual need and take the church outside. I called him, I said, I feel led to come and be with you in New York, in New Jersey. He said, dude, come. And that was the beginning. Together, this worshiper and evangelist and their team set out to bring the church together for a common cause. Preaching on the street, worship on the street, baptisms on the street, people getting saved on the street, people getting healed on the street, baptism in the Holy Spirit on the street, signs, wonders, miracles, and racial reconciliation happening on the streets of America. That's what we are seeing. We prophesy a spirit of revival, God, over this city. We speak a spirit of unity over the church. When we pray tonight, God, that as the worship goes up, walls of division would come down. I pray this week would be a dynamic season of synergy and momentum. The momentum of believers coming together across America was growing as their frustration increased. Social media sites blocked conservatives from exercising free speech. Media attacks on Christian faith was more blatant than ever before. America was becoming more and more divided. 
you've taken some flack for hosting these events, these worship events, even from Christians. You know, what's your response to that? Yeah, I mean, governors, mayors, uh, Christians, friends. I mean, we, we've gotten it all around. But, you know, I think I look at revival history or I look even in the Bible and, and nothing significant takes place to shift things in a generation without some controversy and pushback. Oh, everywhere they don't want Sean to come. Everywhere, most places. They say, we hate you, we don't want you to come. But there's always several thousands of people who are saying, come baby come we need this we need it in our city and that's what we are going for i really feel like the lord called us to do it i know he's not going to leave us high and dry they refused to be stopped no matter what happened they stood in faith and god always came through we should begin to ask ourselves hard questions as believers do we believe god and his word or do we believe the circumstances Sean and Charles continued to rally the church to come together as one voice. The body of Christ needs to be together. Every city across America begin to form coalitions across racial, political, and denominational lines. Bring the church together because only a united church can heal a divided nation. What happened in Chicago demonstrates the power that comes with unity. Believers from different walks of life and different denominations put aside theological differences and work together to overcome obstacles and honor God. In Chicago, they did not want us to set up equipment. They were like, you have the freedom to gather, First Amendment protects you, but if you plug your equipment, we are going to cite you and we are going to arrest you and confiscate the equipment. That is where the flashpoint was. So we're here in Chicago, South Chicago, and uh, we're gathered here. We notified the authorities, the Park Service, the police, and the mayor alerted the police to show up and shut us down. But Christians are rising up. I'm telling you guys, this is a new day for the church. This is our 26th city, and we're not about to stop now. We try to push hard. Hundreds of people live streaming this thing. Everybody on your phone, let them arrest me. We're gonna set up the equipment. The deputy police chief was there. The captains were there. And one captain whispered to me, he said, Pastor, it's not worth it. Please don't do it. It's not worth it. And then Sean shouted, we're gonna go acoustic. And every police officer was like, yeah. The and officers were happy? Uh, they were so happy. Deputy Chief of Police said, Great! I'm going to give you my bullhorn. They gave us their bullhorn, which is massive bullhorn, can address a lot of people. Guess what we did? We sang, preached, and worshipped God with the bullhorn of the city of Chicago. They were sent to arrest us. They came with the bullhorn and helped us preach the gospel. Somebody shout to God for that. As a result, God showed himself in the crowd that night. We are here to worship. We are here to bring peace into the community. You're valuable. A lot of people got saved. They won't let us set up a baptismal. So we put it on the back of a pickup truck, backed it up, and we baptized people for like 40 minutes. As they journeyed from city to city, they saw lives changed and miraculous healings in profound ways. I can hear! You can hear! I can hear! After how many years? 11 years! 11 years! Oh my God! I just felt peace all through my body, all my skin, everything. People eating God for my father, my elder, my free. I know I'm healed. God is so good. 
<laughs> so many healings tonight, so much breakthrough. This is amazing. This is why we do this. I can hear you out of my right ear clearly for the first time in many years. After many surgeries, never been born with the birth respect that I've never been able to hear properly. It always sounds like somebody's talking to me underwater. But I can hear clearly tonight. When Let Us Worship arrived in Tampa, Florida, a longtime friend of Sean's, Michael Molden, shared his particular story with the crowd. You know how valuable your life is? God paid the ultimate price for you. It was September 18th. It was the, the biblical new year. And it happened to be my brother's birthday. And three years prior, my brother committed suicide. And Tampa was his hometown. So it's just like this day of mourning for my family. You know, I go to my parents' house and they're just mourning. I brought them flowers. And, and I just pray and I just felt like God said, it's time to plunder. It's time to extract and, and cash in on what the, what the enemy has stolen from your family. And we go to the event and I didn't know if I was going to even get the mic that day. And Sean starts talking right from the get go. He starts talking about how when they did San Francisco that the police were there because they were on suicide patrol. Because so many people are committing suicide right now in this hour, you know. And, uh, and I just knew it. Well, I, I go, this, this must be the time, you know, to talk about this. And so they... They kind of did salvations and baptisms. It was super powerful. And he goes, do you have a word? And I said, man, I have something burning in my heart for my brother. And he said, go for it, you know? And I was like, look, we're in Tampa. This is the land of buccaneers. This is the land of pirates. I go, there's a godly version of that. Where Jesus went back and stole back the keys of hell. And so I want to release you in this land to go back and take back all of the keys. Come on, stolen from come on, land. come on, let's go. And today's my brother's birthday. And three years ago, he died of suicide. And I don't want to let any of my brothers die like that again. Come on. So if there's anybody in this place that's struggling with mental health, that's struggling with depression, I know we hit it earlier, but I don't want to let anybody go yeah. without Come on. coming forward. Come on. I want to give you the biggest hug you've ever received. I don't want to let any of my brothers go. So if that's you, would you please come to the front? And these guys come rushing to the front out of the crowd. Even one of the camera guys, a guy standing right next to him, comes forward and so he follows the guy through the crowd. And the camera guy had lost his best friend a year prior to suicide. And so he's crying as the camera just following this, this, this emotional moment, right? And the cool thing even for me and Sean was out of all my friends that came to visit me when my brother died that lived out of state, the one person that came in was Sean. And so it was just a significant date that we got to plunder hell together and help set some of the captives free. It was powerful. In October, 2020, let Us Worship had their largest gathering to date on the mall in Washington, D.C. This brought it all full circle for Sean Foyt because this is where God put the passion for revival in his heart two decades before. I want to invite my friend Charles up here from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Because we're going after the restoration of the cities in America. And, and, and... <laughs> The Lord partnered a black dude and a white dude together. And we started to travel across America and we've, we saw God break out in the middle of riots. And this man, he's from Kenya, he ain't afraid of nothing. And Charles began to preach this message of racial reconciliation. Every city we went to, walls begin coming down. America is in a Nehemiah moment. The book of Nehemiah chapter 1 begins with the sad story of Jerusalem. The walls had fallen, they had burnt, and the people were in distress. It is sounds to me like 2020. When they heard of the ruins, and the burning of their cities. Nehemiah rose up and he began to move into a moment of rebuilding the broken walls. I hear the voice of reformers who are going back to Chicago. They are going back to Los Angeles. They are going back to Portland, Oregon and Seattle. Come on. They are going to our broken cities across America and they are saying we will rise up and we will build across America. We declare this is the time to let the healing be
زندگی Yes, it was rainy, cold and wild, Washington DC, 35 to 40,000 people. We are walking through the crowd and we have the poncho and all of a sudden, I hear this, Pam! I can't see, I'm trying to look, I can't see, my eyes are stinging. And I put my hand like that to try and clear my eyes so I can see. And guess what? My hands are full of blood. And it's all over my clothes, it's all over my suit jacket, it's all over my poncho. We find out it wasn't real blood, it was fake blood. It was so fun to see uh, how good it feels to be persecuted for Christ. It embodies us, unfortunately. It allows us to know, hey, you have something for which you are willing to live for and if necessary die. It is important that we be unstoppable, we be bold, we be courageous. That's what Joshua was told by God. Be bold, be courageous. Uh, that's boldness at courage. It's not rebellion, but it is wisdom from God to speak into this issue because nothing will change until we speak. After Washington, D.C., the team ended the year at the site of one of the greatest spiritual moves in America in the last 100 years, Azusa Street in Los Angeles, California. It is Echo Park right across the street from Amy Semple McPherson's house. The amount of hopelessness in that community goes through the roof. We had an incredible amount of hostility and threat. I mean, the noises, the shouting, the screaming, the swearing, as we are worshiping, as we are speaking, they are speaking over that. Some of them, the previous night, had been pepper sprayed, and they had even thrown fire bombs on them. All of a sudden, I see this guy coming. And he's a big dude. I'm a small guy, but I see him coming, and I'm like, what is he up to? He pushes the one person off the way, and then he grabbed the drums and threw them away, pushed the speakers. I'm in front of him. He's coming to me like a distant thunderbolt. I'm like, this dude, if I stand before him, he'll throw me 20 feet away. But one of the security guys from the movement, he tackles him from behind, pushes him out, and then another guy comes, helps to tackle him, and another one comes shouting, you are under arrest, you are under arrest, and he ran away. People are now confused, what do we do? The sound system is down, the music system is down, the drums have been thrown away. And so we came back and we said, you know, don't worry, don't let this distract you, continue worshiping, don't stop worshiping, continue worshiping. It was such a good contrast of good and evil fighting, and then the good prevails. After that, people began getting filled with the Holy Spirit, getting saved, tears. The crowds grew bigger, and there was such an emboldment of worship. It was awesome. And that is what happens when the enemy is rattled. It gives us more courage to continue worshiping. People of California and around the world, we come before the Lord in one accord. We are reminded that a hundred years ago, there was a revival that swept through the land from South California, Azusa Street Revival. We are reminded of the division that broke that revival. But we come here again with the spirit of unity and we declare, this is the time for greater works. This is the time for the redigging of the wells and the releasing of the mantles of old. We shall take that mantle as young people, as old people, as male, female, black, white, and brown. And we shall go forth with the power of the Holy Spirit. Lift your hands up. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I release an outpouring of the power of the Holy Spirit. Receive it in Jesus' name. I 
it is important that America embraces persecution as a badge of honor. There is something so divine about persecution. Peter says in the book of Acts chapter 4, Behold their threatenings. Grant your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching forth your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Unstoppable force of the church is birthed through persecution. And so there is this boldness that comes and it not only comes on you to give you the ability to respond, but there is a manifestation and a demonstration of the miraculous signs and wonders that nobody can put together. In fact, there are some angelic interventions that can only be deployed because of the level of warfare that is being released against us. Charles and Sean have agreed to keep going no matter what. Their goal, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. It's going to be the year of going all out for God. Revival or bust, as John would say. That great awakening is a wave of glory coming from the Lord to heal our land, to bring revival to our land. We are the ecclesia, the government of God on earth, and we rule with Him on earth as it is in heaven. <laughs>